Good morning. Good morning. So the actress Helen Murren, who's one of my favorite actresses, she's an English actress, and she's in her 60s now, and she was interviewed because she's a very busy woman, and she made the comment that, uh, which I'm not saying is necessarily true, but she made the comment, is this speaker system overreacting? Is yes. it too mm -hmm. high? Is they something the going on? Bit. Yeah. I don't know why the buttons ever get moved. Of course, this, this interlude will be on YouTube or wherever this goes to. How is that? I should be talking, right? So you can yeah. adjust. Okay, so she made the comment that, that um, she felt that everyone was young in their mind and that they, they carried an image of themselves from when they were young. And, and I can kind of see that because uh, I always get a surprise when I look in the mirror in the morning, brushing my teeth, you know, and it's, as time goes by it becomes more and more of who is that. So one of the things I do with my students and my friends is I ask them to give me an idea what to talk about. So I asked twice of a friend, what should I talk about tomorrow? And th this is what she came up with. And I thought, mm-hmm. I, I was working the um, day before yesterday. Some of you know that we're uh, in the process of buying a house that's next to the temple where a couple monks can live and then we gives us a big space to have things like parties and receptions. And um, it's a 30 year mobile home and everything's having to be done to it. I mean, literally everything. I've already had a plumber replace all the pipes in this thing because it, as it got older, it would start to leak. And um, so, and we've taken up all the carpet and we're gonna have a new floor put in and right now we're painting. And so my friend a couple days called, a couple of days ago called me, and he's a high school teacher. And I don't know, early 40s. And he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm painting. And just about done all I can do here. I need to stop. And he says, well, you're supposed to be retired. And I go, yeah, sure, okay. And uh, he says, well, what are you doing painting? So I went, well, that's what I'm doing because this has to be done. This house needs to be painted. And I had dinner with him and his family last night. And we were talking a little bit. He brought this up. And I said, well, I've decided when I turn 80 that I, you know, this physical stuff is going to have to kind of slow down. And... Uh, Hopefully I'll have young monks around that can do the, the heavy stuff. And I've already got them doing it. I don't lift real heavy stuff anymore just because I can't. <laughs> so I'll say to them, okay, we need to move that. You and you go, go do it, and they do it. Um, <clears throat> so the suggestion for the talk today was, uh, I guess the way I would express it is the disconnect between what we think and what we can do. <clears throat> which the older we get, the, the, the longer the disconnect gets, the, the stranger it gets, you know, we think, oh, I'll, go, I'll go do that. And, uh, and I repeatedly tell people, we had someone staying with us for almost three months, and she made, repeatedly made observations about things that were not getting done. <laughs> and I repeatedly went, uh-huh, yep, okay. <laughs> Because I've had to tell people in the last couple of years that that uh, I basically work about at a third the speed that I used to work at, and uh, but I'm I'm still going. So it takes me three times as long to get anything done, and uh, she's uh, she has a very demanding mind, and she doesn't understand why this doesn't get done. Now you have to understand what I'm talking about is her perception of what needs to be done, which unfortunately none of us have the same perception of the world. So my perception of what needs to be done and her perception of what needs to be done weren't always the same thing. 
And then I would have to explain, well, no, that didn't get done because one of the things that happened here is a number of projects were in, I, I overextend all the time. So I've got all these things going on. We have three cabins here uh, for people to stay at when we do retreats or if they come up to spend the weekend with us and they're almost done. And everything came to a screeching halt because of this house that, because I have a family that's going to put the new floor in as a donation to the temple. So I've got to get, and I was told, I went to see them in Huntington Beach and I told them I was worried that we wouldn't be ready for them to put the floor in. They said, we want you to do all the painting first because you're going to put a nice hardwood floor in. They said, you've got to get all that done and then we'll come in and we'll take care of that. So everything else came to a halt. And uh, so there was a little, a little bit of uh, uneasiness about that. Well, part of it, again, is this, this issue of what we, I, and I guess the best way to say it is what we used to be able to do and what we can actually do, right, Chuck? What yes. we used to be able to do, and we get up in the morning and we think, I, I like to make lists. I don't ever do anything with them. I sit down in the morning and I say, okay, got to do this, got to do this, got to do this, go to the hardware store, pick up that. And then at the end of the day, for no good purpose, I go and I cross off what I got accomplished. And all that is is me organizing my thoughts for the day. The list has no value other than that. And it's kind of like when I was in college, I discovered that if I took notes, I never had to read the notes. I, that everybody's mind works differently, and my mind worked that if I, if I wrote this stuff down, I would remember it. And I discovered that, because when I went to study my notes, I go, I already know this stuff. But if I didn't take notes, then it would be like, oh, God, what did he say? What did she say? I'm not sure that I remember. I better get that book out. Of course, the book and the, and the talking in the class don't always coincide, so, it was, uh, so that was my great discovery was that uh, taking notes for me was another way to get it stuck in my head. So we have, we have this problem of what we think we can do and what we can actually do, what we used to be able to do and what we can't do. And today we were talking about a rather fantastic chapter in the Lotus Sutra, and I have to keep coming back because I put this monk over and over on the spot and I said, because he was telling us what he read, and he does a good job with that. And I said, so what does this mean? And so he'd start to retell the chapter, and I went, no, 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 no. No, we already know what the chapter says. What does it mean? And he'd start retelling the chapter again, because it's, it's pretty obtuse. You know, it's, it, uh, it, it's not an easy read. It's not very long, but it's, it's, it's so highfalutin, you're trying to figure out what's going on in here, and we got all these Buddhas with fancy names and Bodhisattvas with fancy names, and they're talking about eons of time and all this kind of stuff, and, and amongst all of that, you have to discern what's going on. And so we have to come back to, there's a statement made about this Bodhisattva did all of these things so that he could overcome suffering. I don't like the word suffering, but in the West, with Buddhism, they, they continue to use this word. It, they use it so much that in the East, the people in the East have started using the word suffering. The Buddha never said the word suffering. That's, that's the first problem. This is my campaign, which I'm losing because everybody talks about, oh, life is suffering. No, it's not. Life is not suffering. First of all, life is a series of events. How you accept or contend with these events will determine whether you're unhappy or you're not happy. Notice I avoided the word suffering. Discontent is what happens. And I went off on food today because food is so important to everyone. It's central to our life. We, we don't always admit it. We're not always conscious of it. But talk to anybody that's on a diet about how much they think about food. You know, if you're, you're, you're eating as unconstrained and you can eat anything you want and you have no limitations and you have no food allergies and all that sort of stuff, I guess you wouldn't think about much. I do. I told everybody today, I eat very little for breakfast, but I have to have something so I can take out this, this legion of pills I take. <laughs> but I think about lunch as I'm having my insurer. 
<laughs> I think about lunch because there's nothing exciting about the insurer. So I'm, I'm thinking, what am I going to have for lunch? What's in the refrigerator that I can put together? And then after I have lunch and I get a little work done in the afternoon, I start thinking about, I wonder what's for dinner. Very central. I always like to think back to when I went into the Army as a young man, and I discovered that when I went to the mess hall to have a meal, that some people actually were concerned about what they were eating. I thought it was really neat that I got to eat something three times a day, because <laughs> that didn't always happen at home. And, and to go in there and find out, not only was there, there three meals a day, but there was as much food as you could eat. You could go, if, if they would fill up your tray, and then if you wanted more, you could go back for more. And that wasn't the way it worked in our house. You know, we had a can of spaghetti that got split between three kid, four kids. And, and uh, it was split between four kids and we had uh, bread and butter and, uh, and maybe some milk and that was it. And that was a pretty normal meal for us. And that was a good meal, by the way. That, that was one of the better ones. And, uh, you know, once in a while we had dessert, which was bread and butter with sugar sprinkled on it. Anybody ever eat that? Anybody ever have bread and butter with sugar sprinkled on it? No? Yeah. No? Yes? Okay. All right. We got one. All right. The rest of you must have been rich. <laughs> because, so I go in the army and there, and there's, gosh, there's, there's food I'd never heard of. And the, the cook, I remember at Fort Campbell, the cook, he was Italian and once a month he made spaghetti. And everybody was there for when he made spaghetti for dinner because he was a real Italian cook. And it's the only time he cooked, the rest of the time he supervised. And, and I got all of these different things to eat, and I thought it was, it must have been what it was like for someone coming from a foreign country and visiting Japan or Disneyland and being overwhelmed and overstimulated because I thought, look at that. And you know, Chuck, do you remember you could get, we could get white milk and we could get chocolate milk? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Chocolate milk. I mean, chocolate milk. I don't even remember what the occasion of my family was when we got <laughs> chocolate milk. But I think for about a year, all I had with my meals was chocolate milk because they had that, that machine, you know, where they put the big container. But there were a lot of guys that would hardly eat anything on their tray. And, it, and this is when I really started looking at the way people interacted with their environment and with the world, trying to understand why they weren't eating this food. And some of it was, it was something they'd never eaten before. Just that simple. It was something so foreign to them. And we really have, most people have a very limited diet in the sense of all the different kinds of foods they eat. Now, we're, <clears throat> we're in a unique country. Francisco uh, was, was talking, uh, you know, ethnic distributions here with me. He's been doing a lot of heavy reading. Mm -hmm. But you know, you think about it, we can go have Italian food and, and uh, Thai food and Chinese food and Japanese food and of course, lots of Mexican food in the high desert, you know. And we have all these different kinds of foods besides whatever it is kind of food, middle European food that we grew up with. But I think back and my mother used to put, my mother was a list maker, this is where I got it from. She would put a, a menu, I guess, basically that's what you'd call it, up on the refrigerator at one point in her life. And so that was her way of organizing what we had. So one night was macaroni and cheese, and one night was Chef Boyardee uh, spaghetti, you know. And I'm trying to think of the other stuff. A lot of stuff came out of a can. My mother worked, so I was the kid with the can opener because I was the oldest. And... Um, and then it repeated itself. And so it repeated itself every seven to 10 days and we were eating basically the same stuff. And we had meat once a week on Friday, payday. And the rest of the time there was no meat. So it's a great argument for we can survive without meat every day because we did and we grew up big and strong. But um, 
I'm looking at these guys in the military and they're taking a tray full of good food and dumping it. And that, in my family, would have been like the cardinal sin. This would be the worst thing you could ever do, is throw away perfectly good food. One of the reasons why I'm on a perpetual diet is because I was taught never to leave anything on a plate, right? From those days. Uh, that's the depression era uh, mentality that you eat everything because you're starving children in Korea back then when I was a kid. Now it's other places in the world where they're starving instead of taking small portions. And uh, so what has this all got to do with anything? Well, it's got to do with being dissatisfied with our life. And, Susan wrote me a poem about me with a Coca-Cola in my hand and a trowel in the other hand because I like to talk about that last Coca-Cola that gets hidden in the back of the refrigerator. This is my way of connecting with you about what I'm talking about with dissatisfaction. It's not suffering. People aren't grumpy because they suffer. People go through anguish because they suffer, but they're not grumpy because they suffer. But you've got one Coca-Cola left, so you hide it in the back so that you can have it when you want it. And so you've made your favorite sandwich for lunch, whatever that might be. And you've got your chips and your pickles and your sandwich, and you go to get your Coke, and it's, you've got it hidden behind this Tupperware container of whatever, and it's gone. And that moment right there is the dissatisfaction I'm talking about. And it was the dissatisfaction the Buddha was talking about. Life is filled moment to moment with dissatisfaction and discontent. Because if I'm the wrong person, I start screaming. I start yelling. If I'm the dad, I start yelling, who got back there and got my coke? Okay, if I'm living with a bunch of roommates, I'm going tearing into the other room, yelling at them, who took my last Coke, you know that was my Coke, and blah, 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 like that. That's the kind of dissatisfaction. We have dissatisfaction with the weather. We walk out on the porch. Some people, and I find it hard to believe in California that anybody could be unhappy about all the rain we're getting, but there are people that complain because maybe they just got their hair done and they walk outside and they go, oh, and, you know, their hair is starting, to, they're losing their hair set or whatever. Or they want to, the guy wants to wear his suede jacket and we don't walk around in the rain in a suede jacket, so it limits what we can do. Another way, my grandmother would say you can always complain because there's always something to complain about. You can find it. Mm -hmm. um, we just had an election. We have a new president. Now, roughly half of this country is happy about that, but I find it unique how unhappy the other half is. Roughly, I say roughly half. Won't get into the numbers game with you about this thing, but a lot of people voted for him, so there has to be some happy people, but you wouldn't know it reading the newspaper because it's all full of burning limousines and marches on Washington and the end of the world is coming and the sky is falling and, uh, you know, if, if we don't all starve to death or we don't die because we don't have medical care or, or the Russians drop a bomb on us because everything bad that could possibly happen in the universe is going to happen. So we're going to walk around unhappy and discontent. If you have not read the letters to the editor in our local newspaper, and I use that term loosely, if you have not read them, you need to buy a, a, a press, what is it, is it the, it's not the press telegram, daily press. Mm -hmm. I used to throw the te press telegram in Long Beach in the morning before people got up. Uh, I, I've got to the point now, I just skim the letters to the editor because it's all these people complaining about each other. And they write to each other in this thing. There's about 20 people that spend their time writing back and forth. And I really feel like I should write a letter that says, why don't you put your phone number in here so you guys can argue on the phone or get together at McDonald's and have a cup of coffee and argue about the stuff that you're unhappy about. And according to these guys, on both sides of the, of the aisle, as they say in Congress, it doesn't matter whether they're 
conservatives or they're liberals, the end of the world has come. It has literally come. And everything bad that could possibly happen in the universe, he's just looking at the TV. He's comparing me to the little film thing. Uh, and I don't get looking any better in that little thing, do I? He says, no, he says, no. Because kids are always honest. Um, so we, we, we have this chance to always be unhappy about something, except that, you know, when I came out this morning, it was incredibly beautiful here in the desert because the desert loves water. And the more water you give it. Now, when we get to the point where the roads start washing out, which they do here, that's why we own a, at the, we own a tractor at the temple <laughs> to maintain these roads. But... Um, there's so many things not to complain about, so many things not to be unhappy about. Um, but we get out of whack. Our mind and our body uh, no longer are functioning together. You know, I, uh, we have a couple new people here. And so I just got done here oh, about five weeks ago. I spent six days in the hospital. Uh, always an adventure. A good place to go to get a rest. <laughs> Susan would disagree because Susan is a nurse and she would go the last place you want to go to get a rest is a hospital. But when you can't, uh, when you can't breathe and they get you in there and they start pumping air into you, that's pretty close to a rest for me compared to the, the adventure because Susan was here with me as I was turning gray and she was going, I think it's time maybe we call the ambulance because I couldn't breathe. So I have very little to complain about. And I have very little to be dissatisfied with. And I'm really breathing pretty good, except that anxiety keeps sneaking around the corner to say, are, are you doing OK? And if you ask that question yourself too many times, it becomes the problem. That anxiety that you have because you go, well, I don't know if that's really a full breath. <sighs> Am I really getting air in there? And Susan liked to tell me before I had this little heart procedure, <laughs> which is part of my hospital stays, that it took me about 15 minutes when we started meditating, it took me about 15 minutes for my breathing to settle down. And I didn't realize that. But she's very conscious of that kind of stuff. And then she... Once they, once they went in and spent six hours messing with my heart, she said, well, you're breathing much better. Right, Susan? Mm -hmm. Much better. Yeah. And I told a friend last night, <laughs> he says, how is your heart? I said, my heart's really good. And he says, well, what do, you, what, do you, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, before I had that heart procedure, I'd breathe like this. If I walked over to your sink to get a glass of water, I'd breathe like this. <laughs> And that would go on for a while. And I said, now, when I walk over the sink, I only breathe like this. <sighs> and he says, well, what's the difference? I said, well, that's congestive heart failure, which I can't get rid of. The other one was <laughs> the other problem. So there's no way to get rid of these things. It's called getting old. That's all it is. It's just getting old. And if you don't want to get old, I don't know what to tell you <laughs> because I, I, I read about diets that are going to keep you from getting old. I had a, a gentleman call me. He may watch this and go, Ugh. he's into Eastern medicine and he told me that I was young. He says, oh, you're very young. And I went, okay. <laughs> That's what's in my head. My body's got a little difficulty with this. And he says, yes, everybody should live to be 115. I thought that was an interesting number. I'm not sure where he got that number, but it all has to do with if you, if you were to eat right and exercise right, you'd live to 115. Uh, I hate to say it, but there's no science backing that up. We know if we eat right, we feel better. Now, the, the question, and honestly, this is my question, is it about living forever or is it about living good? Do you want to feel good in this moment? Then I suggest you don't. I overate last night, by the way. I ate two meals. I knew it when I was doing it. It was so good. <laughs> and then I thought, oh boy, was that a big mistake. But 
we, we, we lose sight of it. The Europeans did it, the Orientals did it, they started Taoism with the idea that if you could figure out all the secrets of life, you could live forever. And really, that's the point of the whole mystical Taoism, is that if you learn to breathe correctly and learn the right meditation and learn the right foods to eat, you'll live forever. Okay, so the Buddha would say, at the age of 80, so you want to have arthritis forever? Because he had terrible arthritis. <laughs> so that's what you want to have? I, I, can, I can really buy into the idea of recycling to where I have a, you know, a few decades of no arthritis, and then the arthritis starts up again. And then we just accept it and not get too carried away about the whole thing. But there is no magic bullet. And I know lots of people, probably half the people in this room would disagree with me because they have a magic bullet. It can be everything from drinking three gallons of water a day to never having any processed grains to, you know, let's not have any cane sugar. We can only eat molasses. And, you know, there's, there's all these ideas. And they all have value. And the bottom line is, how do you feel? If you eat this diet you're talking about, do you feel good? Do you enjoy your food? Because, by the way, food should be enjoyable. Do you enjoy your food? Do you feel good? Then whatever you're doing is right. If you do like I did last night, I overate. I literally ate two meals. I cleaned my plate. Everybody at the table <laughs> refilled their plate. So I went, oh, okay. And so, and started overeating and knew I was doing it and knew I would suffer today from doing that and fell off the wagon. So I'll have to go to a meeting of, oh, and I've never been to one, to Overeaters Anonymous and confess that I just got carried away. But I'm not going to be unhappy about it. I'm just going to be a little more careful the next time. And life is just about seeing what's there and accepting it as it is. And the disconnect we have between our body and mind is okay. Because we live with our memories. So we think, well, I can, I can, uh, I, I used to run. <laughs> you ought to see me run now. It's hysterical to watch. <laughs> I tried it a couple times and it's, it doesn't work. I just look like this big lumbering guy trying to go someplace. So now I just walk fast instead of running. But for 30 years, I ran every day. And those days are over with. And it takes the mind a while to remember that, no, you can't do this and you can't do that. And I was reminded yesterday that I should only work three or four hours a day. And then I'm back to overdoing it again. And so I worked for four and a half hours, right? Yeah. And quit. And I told him, I said, okay, I'm done. That's it. I'm going to go eat lunch and I'm going to take a nap. I'm done working today. Susan would have been proud of me. I almost yeah. called her and said, okay, I'm not going to overdo it today because I overdid it the two days before. So we get into these habits and the habits are very hard to break. And yet if we step back and look at them, we realize that we want to kind of have what's in our head and what's in our body a little closer together. A little more realistic. When I was in the hospital, they moved me from upstairs to downstairs, and they said, We're going to move you into a room where you can walk. <laughs> so I got, I got down in this room, I got all this stuff connected to me, and the nurse comes in and I said, I want to get up and walk. And she says, What are you talking about? I said, Well, you got all this stuff connected to me, and I, they told me that you put me in this room so I could walk. And she said, Yeah, to the bathroom. <laughs> so it took a couple of days and then finally I said you know is there any chance that I could get up and actually walk and they said well yeah okay you're doing pretty good so they let me go out in the hallway and, and walk and then the first thing I did at St. Mary's Hospital was get lost <laughs> and I finally had to grab someone after half an hour and go I don't know where my room is anymore so it's all this thing of matching the two of them together. And it doesn't have to be painful. It only has to be painful if you resist the idea that change has happened. You know, there's only a couple of constants in Buddhism. 
It's, it's such a simple way of living our life. And one of those is, is that everything changes all the time. There's nothing that stays the same. The universe doesn't stay the same. This poor old mountain here, this is called Iron Mountain in our back door here. And it used to be really tall. And it's really small now. And that's all granite. And it's all over thousands of years diminished until we have just a little hill over here that I've used to climb all the time, but I don't do it anymore. But I used to go up to the top of that on a regular basis. So this constant changing, we have to learn to accept it. Because the Buddha said there's two things that cause us to be unhappy in our life. One is to not have the things we want to have. And that's desire. And the other is we want to, we're, we're attached to things, we cling to things, and we don't want things to change. And so we have to learn to accept that change. And if we can learn to accept it, then there's one source of unhappiness that goes away. And if we can learn to accept the fact that I have a friend at 50, she moved to Nashville to become a star. <laughs> Never going to happen. Because you got 20-year-old, you know, like models, these girls, they look like they come out of there. Uh, so, but she moved back there, and she's probably only about 60 pounds overweight. And a sweet girl and a great voice, but she's never going to be a star. It's just the reality of it, and she didn't, she always wanted to be a star. So she's back there now not being a star. And that's okay. Some people know I play music. I'm not a star. You know, once a month now I go and play music at a deli. We got a new venue, Chuck. You and Susan will have to come. Yeah, so we got, I'm going to see if Susan's feeling good. Susan's a bass player besides being a nurse. So maybe if she's feeling good the day we play, she can play bass for us. You get a free meal if you do that, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> so. It's all about just accepting things as they are. Or changing the things you can change and accepting the things you can't change. It's just that simple. 